between the sunset and the sea by algernon charles swinburne read for LibriVox.org by martin geeson between the sunset and the sea my love laid hands and lips on me of sweet came sour of day came night of long desire came brief delight ah love and what thing came of thee between the sea downs and the sea between the sea mark and the sea joy grew to grief grief grew to me love turned to tears and tears to fire and dead delight to new desire love's talk love's touch there seemed to be between the sea sand and the sea between the sundown and the sea love watched one hour of love with me then down the all-golden waterways his feet flew after yesterdays i saw them come and saw them flee between the sea foam and the sea between the sea strand and the sea love fell on sleep sleep fell on me the first star saw twain turn to one between the moonrise and the sun the next that saw not love saw me between the sea banks and the sea end of poem this recording is in the public domain boots by rudyard kipling read for librivox.org by noel badrian county offaly ireland 15th of december 2011 where a foot slog 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 slogging over africa foot 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 slogging over africa boots 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 moving up and down again there's no discharge in the war seven six eleven five nine and twenty miles today four eleven seventeen thirty two the day before boots 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 moving up and down again there's no discharge in the war don't 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 look at what's in front of you boots 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 moving up and down again men 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 go mad with watching them and there's no discharge in the war count 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 the bullets in the bandoliers if your eyes drop they will get the top of you boots 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 moving up and down again there's no discharge in the war try 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 to think of something different oh my god keep me from going lunatic boots 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 moving up and down again there's no discharge in the war we can stick out hunger thirst and weariness but not 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 the chronic sight of them boots 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 moving up and down again there's no discharge in the war i have marched six weeks in l and certify it is not fire devil's dark or anything but boots 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 moving up and down again and there's no discharge in the wall end of poem this recording is in the public domain
Buffalo Bills by E. E. Cummings Read for LibriVox.org by Lubet Buffalo Bills defunct, who used to ride a water-smooth silver stallion and break one, two, three, four, five pigeons just like that. Jesus, he was a handsome man. And what I want to know is, how do you like your blue-eyed boy, Mr. Death? End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Casabianca by Felicia Dorothea Hemans. Read for LibriVox.org by Algy Pug. Perth, Western Australia. Casabianca. In the Battle of the Nile, thirteen year old Casabianca, son of the Admiral of the Orient, remained at his post after the ship had taken fire and all the guns had been abandoned. He perished when the vessel exploded. The boy stood on the burning deck whence all but he had fled. The flame that lit the battle's wreck shone round him o'er the dead. Yet beautiful and bright he stood as born to rule the storm a creature of heroic blood, a proud though childlike form. The flames rolled on. He would not go without his father's word. That father, faint in death below, his voice no longer heard. He called aloud, Say, father, say, if yet my task is done. He knew not that the chieftain lay unconscious of his son. Speak, father, once again he cried, If I may yet be gone, And but the booming shots replied, And fast the flames rolled on. Upon his brow he felt their breath, And in his waving hair, And looked from that lone post of death, In still yet brave despair, And shouted but once more aloud, My father, must I stay? While o'er him fast, through sail and shroud, The wreathing fires made way. They wrapped the ship in splendour wild, they caught the flag on high, and streamed above the gallant child, like banners in the sky. There came a burst of thunder sound, the boy, oh, where was he? Ask of the winds that far around with fragments strewed the sea, with shroud and mast and pen and fair, that well had borne their part. But the noblest thing that perished there was that young faithful heart. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Chronicle by Abraham Cowley. Read for LibriVox.org by Noel Badrian, County Offaly, Ireland, 14th of December, 2011. Margarita first possessed, if I remember well, my breast. Margarita, first of all, but when a while the wanton maid with my restless heart had played, Martha took the flying ball. Martha soon did it resign to the beauteous Catherine. Beauteous Catherine gave place, though loath and angry she to part with the possession of my heart, to Eliza's conquering face. Eliza, till this hour might reign, had she not evil counsels ta'en, fundamental laws she broke, and still new favourites she chose, till up in arms my passions rose, and cast away her yoke. Mary then, and gentle Anne, both to reign at once began. Alternately they swayed, and sometimes Mary was the fair, and sometimes Anne the crown did wear, and sometimes both I obeyed. Another Mary then arose, and did rigorous laws impose, a mighty tyrant she, long, alas, should I have been under that iron sceptred queen, had not Rebecca set me free. When fair Rebecca set me free, twas then a golden time with me, but soon those pleasures fled. For the gracious princess died in her youth and beauty's pride, And Judith reigned in her stead. One month, three days, and half an hour, Judith held the sovereign power. Wondrous 
beautiful her face but so weak and small her wit that she to govern was unfit and so susanna took her place but when isabella came armed with a resistless flame and the artillery of her eye whilst she proudly marched about greater conquests to find out she beat out susan by the by but in her place i then obeyed black-eyed bess her viceroy maid to whom ensured a vacancy thousand worse passions then possessed the interregnum of my breast bless me for such an anarchy gentle henriette then and a third mary next began then joan and jane and audria and then a pretty thomasine and then another catherine and then a long etc but should i now to you relate the strength and riches of their state the powder patches and the pins the ribbons jewels and the rings the lace the paint and warlike things that make up all their magazines if i should tell the politic arts to take and keep men's hearts the letters embassies and spies the frowns and smiles and flatteries the quarrels tears and perjuries numberless nameless mysteries and all the little lime twigs laid by machiavel the waiting maid i more voluminous should grow chiefly if i like them should tell all change of weathers that befell then holland's head or stow but i will briefer with them be since few of them were long with me and higher and a nobler strain my present empress doth claim eleonora first of the name whom god grant long to reign end of poem this recording is in the public domain a farewell by edith nesbitt read for LibriVox.org by chris goodbye goodbye it is not hard to part you have my heart the heart that leaps to hear your name called by an echo in a dream you have my soul that like an untroubled stream reflects your soul that leans so dear so near your heart beats at the rhythm for my heart what more could life give if we gave her leave to give and life should give us leave to take only each other's arms each other's eyes each other's lips the clinging accessories that are but as the written words to make records of what the heart and soul achieve this only this we yield my love my friend to fate's implacable eyes and withering breath we still are yours and mine though by time's theft my arms are empty and your arms bereft it is not hard to part not harder than death and each of us must face death in the end end of poem this recording is in the public domain February by Helen Hunt Jackson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Matt Perard. February. Still lie the sheltering snows undimmed and white, and reigns the winter's pregnant silence still. No sign of spring save that the catkins fill, and willow stems grow daily red and bright. These are days when ancients held a rite of expiation for the old year's ill, and prayer to purify the new year's will. Fit days, ere yet the spring rains blur the sight, ere yet the bounding blood grows hot with haste, and dreaming thoughts grow heavy with a greed, the ardent summer's joy to have and taste. Fit days to give to last year's losses heed, to reckon clear, the new life's sterner need, fit days for feast of expiation placed. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The First Snowfall by James Russell Lowell Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio 
the snow had begun in the gloaming and busily all the night had been heaping field and highway with a silence deep and white every pine and fir and hemlock wore ermine too dear for an earl and the poorest twig on the elm tree was ridged inch deep with pearl from sheds new roofed with carrara came chanticleer's muffled crow the stiff rails softened to swan's down and still fluttered down the snow i stood and watched by the window the noiseless work of the sky and the sudden flurries of snowbirds like brown leaves whirling by i thought of a mound in sweet auburn where a little headstone stood how the flakes were folding it gently as did robins the babes in the wood up spoke our own little mabel saying father who makes it snow and i told of the good all-father who cares for us here below again i looked at the snowfall and thought of the leaden sky that arched o'er our first great sorrow when that mound was heaped so high i remembered the gradual patience that fell from that cloud like snow flake by flake healing and hiding the scar that renewed our woe and again to the child i whispered the snow that husheth all darling the merciful father alone can make it fall then with eyes that saw not i kissed her and she kissing back could not know that my kiss was given to her sister folded close under deepening snow End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Forsaken Garden by Elgin and Charles Swinburne Read for LibriVox.org by Casper Nyssen In a coin of the cliff between lowland and highland At the sea down's edge between windward and lee Walled round with rocks as an inland island, The ghost of a garden fronts the sea. A girdle of brushwood and thorn encloses The steep square slope of the blossomless bed, Where the weeds that grew green from the graves of its roses Now lie dead. The fields fall southward, abrupt and broken, to the low last edge of the long lone land. If a steep should sound or a word be spoken, Would a ghost not rise at the strange guest's hand? So long have the grey bare walks lain guestless, Through branches and briars if a man make way, He shall find no life but the sea winds, Restless night and day. The dense hard passage is blind and stifled, That crawls by a track, none turn to climb, To the straight waste place that the years have rifled, Of all but the thorns that are touched not of time. The thorns he spares when the rose is taken, The rocks are left when he wastes the plain. The wind that wanders, the weeds wind shaken, These remain. Not a flower to be pressed of the foot that falls not, As the heart of a dead man the seed plots are dry. From the thicket of thorns when the nightingale calls not, Could she call there were never a rose to reply. Over the meadows that blossom and wither Rings but the note of a sea bird's song. Only the sun and the rain come hither all year long. The sun burns sear, and the rain dishevels On gaunt bleak blossom of scentless breath. Only the wind here hovers and revels In a round where life seems barren as death. Here there was laughing of old, there was weeping, Haply, of lovers none ever will know, 
whose eyes went seaward a hundred sleeping years ago. Hard hand fast in heart as they stood, look thither, did he whisper, look forth from the flowers to the sea, for the foam flowers endure when the rose blossoms wither, and men that love lightly may die, but we, and the same wind sang, and the same waves whitened, and or ever the garden's last petals were shed, in the lips that had whispered, the eyes that had lightened, love was dead. Or they loved their life through, and then went whither, and were one to the end, but what end, who knows? Love deep as the sea, as a rose must wither, as the rose-red seaweed that mocks the rose. Shall the dead take thought for the dead to love them? What love was ever as deep as a grave? They are loveless now as the grass above them or the wave. All are at one now, roses and lovers, not known of the cliffs and the fields and the sea. Not the breath of the time that has been hovers In the air now soft with the summer to be. Not the breath shall they sweeten the seasons hereafter Of the flowers or the lovers that laugh now or weep, When as they that are free now of weeping and laughter We shall sleep. Here death may deal not again forever, here change may come not, till all change end. From the graves they have made, they shall rise up never, Who have left naught living to ravage and rend. Earth, stones, and thorns of the wild ground growing, While the sun and the rain live, these shall be. Till a last wind's breath upon all these blowing, Roll the sea. Till the slow sea rise and the sheer cliff crumble, Till terrace and meadow the deep gulfs drink, Till the strength of the waves of the high tides humble The fields that lessen, the rocks that shrink. Here now in a triumph where all things falter, Stretched out on the spoils that his own hands spread, as a god self slain on his own strange altar, death lies dead. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. A Fragment by William Wordsworth This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Fragment by William Wordsworth Between two sister moorland rills There is a spot that seems to lie, Sacred to flowerets of the hills, And sacred to the sky. And in this smooth and open dell There is a tempest-stricken tree, A cornerstone by lightning cut, The last stone of a cottage hut. And in this dell you see a thing no storm can e'er destroy, The shadow of a Danish boy. In clouds above the lark is heard, He sings his blithest and his beat. But in this lonesome nook the bird Did ever build his nest. No beast, no bird, hath here his home. The bees born on the breezy air Pass high above those fragrant bells. To other flowers, to other dells, Nor ever linger he there. The Danish boy walks here alone. The lovely dell is all his own. A spirit of noonday is he. He seems a form of flesh and blood. A piping shepherd he might be. A herd boy of the wood. A regal vest of fur he wears. In color like a raven's wing. It fears nor rain, nor wind no dew. But in the storm tis fresh and blue. As budding pines in spring. His helmet has a vernal grace, Fresh as the bloom upon his face. A harp is from his shoulder slung, He rests the harp upon his knee, And there is a forgotten tongue, He warbles melody. 
of flocks and herbs both far and near he is the darling and the joy and often when no cause appears the mountain ponies prick their ears they hear the danish boy while in the dell he sits alone beside the tree and corner stone when near this blasted tree you pass two sods are plainly to be seen close at its root and each with grass it covered fresh and green like turf upon a new-made grave these two green sods together lie nor heat nor cold nor rain nor wind can these two sods together bind nor sun nor earth nor sky but side by side the two are laid as if just severed by the spade there sits he in his face you spy no trace of a ferocious air nor ever was a cloudless sky no steady or so fair the lovely danish boy is blessed and happy in his flowery cove from bloody deeds his thoughts are and yet he warbles songs of war they seem like songs of love for calm and gentle is his mien like a dead boy he is serene end of poem this recording is in the public domain a goodbye by edith nesbitt read for LibriVox.org by Chris. Farewell, how soon unmeasured distance rolls, its leaden clouds between our parted souls. How little to each other now are we, and once how much I dreamed we two might be. I, who now stand with eyes undimmed and dry, to say goodbye, to say goodbye to all sweet memories, goodbye to tender questions, soft replies, goodbye to hope, goodbye to dreaming too, goodbye to all things dear, goodbye to you without a kiss, a tear, a prayer, a sigh, our last goodbye. I had no chains to bind you with that all, no grace to charm, no beauty to enthrall, no power to hold your eyes with mine and make your heart on fire with longing for my sake, till all the yearning passed into one cry, love, not goodbye. Ah, no, I had no strength like that, you know, yet my worst weakness was to love you so, so much too well so much too well or ill yet even that might have been parted still it would have been had i been you you but now goodbye how soon the bitter follows on the street could i not chain your fancy's flying feet could i not hold your soul to make you play tomorrow in the key of yesterday dear do you dream that i would stoop to try ah no goodbye end of poem this recording is in the public domain. I Do Not Love Thee by Caroline Elizabeth Sarah Norton Read for LibriVox.org by Ashley Jane I do not love thee, no, I do not love thee, And yet when thou art absent I am sad, And envy even the bright blue sky above thee, whose quiet stars may see thee and be glad. I do not love thee, yet I know not why, whate'er thou dost seems still well done to me, and often in my solitude I sigh that those I do love are not more like thee. I do not love thee, yet when thou art gone, I hate the sound, though those who speak be dear, which breaks the lingering echo of the tone thy voice of music leaves upon my ear. I do not love thee, yet thy speaking eyes, with their deep bright and most expressive blue, between me and the midnight heaven arise, oftener than any eyes I ever knew. I know I do not love thee, yet, alas, others will scarcely trust my candid heart, and oft I catch them smiling as they pass, because they see me gazing where thou art. End of poem this recording is in the public domain. In a Breton Cemetery by Ernest Dowson Read for LibriVox.org by Kasper Nijsen They sleep well here, these fisher folk who passed their anxious days in fierce Atlantic ways and found not there, beneath the long curled wave, so quiet a grave. 
and they sleep well. These peasant folk who told their lives away from day to market day. As one should tell with patient industry some sad old rosary. And now night falls, me, tempest tossed, and driven from pillar to post, a poor worn ghost, this quiet pasture calls. And dear dead people with pale hands beckon me to their lands. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud by William Wordsworth Read for LibriVox.org by Lucy Perry I wandered lonely as a cloud That floats on high o'er vales and hills When all at once I saw a crowd A host of golden daffodils Beside the lake, beneath the trees Fluttering and dancing in the breeze Continuous as the stars that shine And twinkle on the Milky Way they stretched in never-ending line along the margin of a bay. Ten thousand saw I at a glance, tossing their heads in sprightly dance. The waves beside them danced, but they outdid the sparkling waves in glee. A poet could not but be gay in such a jocund company. I gazed, and gazed, but little thought what wealth the show to me had brought. For oft, when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude, and then my heart with pleasure fills, and dances with the daffodils. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Leisure by William Henry Davis Read for LibriVox.org by Michael Dalling What is this life, if full of care, We have no time to stand and stare, No time to stand beneath the boughs, And stare as long as sheep or cows, No time to see when woods we pass, Where squirrels hide their nuts in grass, No time to see in broad daylight, Streams full of stars like skies at night, No time to turn at beauty's glance, and watch her feet how they can dance. No time to wait till her mouth can enrich that smile her eyes began. A poor life this, if full of care, we have no time to stand and stare. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Lover Speaks by E. Eslin Cummings Read for LibriVox.org by Miss Avarice Your little voice over the wires came leaping And I felt suddenly dizzy With the jostling and shouting of merry flowers We skipping high-heeled flames Courtesied before my eyes Or twinkling over to my side Looked up with impertinently exquisite faces, floating hands were laid upon me. I was whirled and tossed into delicious dancing. Up, up, with the pale, important stars and the humorous moon. Dear girl, how I was crazy, how I cried when I heard, over time, and tide and death leaping sweetly your voice end of poem this recording is in the public domain matilda who told lies and was burned to death by hilaire belloc read for LibriVox.org by michael dowling Matilda told such dreadful lies, it made one gasp and stretch one's eyes. Her aunt, who from her earliest youth had kept a strict regard for truth, attempted to believe Matilda. The effort very nearly killed her, and would have done so had not she, 
discovered this infirmity, for once, towards the close of day, Matilda, growing tired of play, and finding she was left alone, went tiptoe to the telephone, and summoned the immediate aid of London's noble fire brigade. Within an hour the gallant band were pouring in on every hand, from Putney, Hackney Downs, and Bow, with courage high and hearts aglow. They galloped, roaring through the town. Matilda's house is burning down! Inspired by British cheers, and loud, proceeding from the frenzied crowd, they ran their ladders through a score of windows on the ballroom floor, and took peculiar pains to souse the pictures up and down the house, until Matilda's aunt succeeded in showing them they were not needed. And even then she had to pay to get the men to go away. It happened that a few weeks later her aunt was off to the theatre, to see that interesting play, the second of Mrs. Tanqueray. She had refused to take her niece to hear this entertaining piece, a deprivation just and wise to punish her for telling lies. That night a fire did break out. You should have heard Matilda shout. You should have heard her scream and bawl, and throw the window up and call to people passing in the street, the rapidly increasing heat, encouraging her to obtain their confidence, but all in vain, for every time she shouted, Fire! they only answered, Little liar! And therefore, when her aunt returned, Matilda and the house were burned. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Mr. Flood's Party by Edwin Arlington Robinson Read for LibriVox.org by Michael R. Piazza Old Eben Flood, climbing alone one night Over the hill between the town below And the forsaken upland hermitage That held as much as he should ever know On earth again of home, paused warily The road was his with not a native near. And Eben, having leisure, said aloud, for no man else in Tilbury town to hear, Well, Mr. Flood, we have the harvest moon again, and we may not have many more. The bird is on the wing, the poet says, and you and I have said it here before. Drink to the bird. He raised up to the light the jug that he had gone so far to fill, and answered huskily, Well, Mr. Flood, since you propose it, I believe I will. Alone, as if enduring to the end a valiant armor of scarred hopes outworn, he stood there in the middle of the road, like Roland's ghost, winding a silent horn. Below him, in the town among the trees where friends of other days had honored him, a phantom salutation of the dead rang thinly till old Eben's eyes were dim. Then, as a mother lays her sleeping child down tenderly, fearing it may awake, he set the jug down slowly at his feet with trembling care, knowing that most things break, and only when assured that on firm earth it stood, as the uncertain lives of men assuredly did not, he paced away, and with his hand extended, paused again. Well, Mr. Flood, we have not met like this in a long time, and many a change has come to both of us, I fear, since last it was we had a drop together. Welcome home. Convivially, Returning with himself, again he raised the jug up to the light, and with an acquiescent quaver said, Well, Mr. Flood, if you insist, I might. Only a very little, Mr. Flood, for auld lang syne. No more, sir, that will do. So, for a time, apparently it did, and Eben evidently thought so too. For soon, amid the silver loneliness of night, 
he lifted up his voice and sang, secure with only two moons listening, until the whole harmonious landscape rang. For old lang syne. The weary throat gave out, the last word wavered, and the song being done, he raised again the jug regretfully, and shook his head, and was again alone. There was not much that was ahead of him, and there was nothing in the town below, where strangers would have shut the many doors that many friends had opened long ago. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Rebirth by Rudyard Kipling Read for LibriVox.org by Liam Neely If any god should say, I will restore the world her yesterday, whole as before. My judgment blasted it. Who would not lift heart, eye, and hand in passion or the gift? If any god should will to wipe from mind the memory of this ill which is mankind, in soul and substance now, who would not bless even to tears his loving tenderness. If any god should give us leave to fly, these present deaths we live and safely die. In those lost lives we lived ere we were born, what man but would not laugh the excuse to scorn? For we are what we are, so broke to blood, and the strict words of war so long subdued, to sacrifice that threadbare death commands, hardly observance at our busier hands. Yet we were what we were, and fashioned so, it pleases us to stare at the far show of unbelievable years and shapes that flit in our own likeness on the edge of it. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Sky Was by E. E. Cummings Read for LibriVox.org by Lubet The sky was candy, luminous, edible, spry, Pinks, shy, lemons, greens, cool chocolates. Under a locomotive, spouting violets. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Song for the Wandering Jew by William Wordsworth. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. For the Wandering Jew by William Wordsworth Though the torrents from their fountains roar down many a craggy steep, yet they find among the mountains resting places calm and deep. Clouds that love through air to hasten, ere the storm its furry stills, helmet-like themselves will fasten on the heads of towering hills. What if the frozen center of the Alps the Camus bound? Yet he has a home to enter, in some nook of chosen ground. And the seahorse, though the ocean yield him no domestic cave, slumbers without sense of notion, couched upon the rocking wave. If on windy days the raven gamble like a dancing skiff, not the less she loves her haven, in the bosom of the cliff. The fleet ostrich, till day closes, Vagrant over desert sands, Brooding on her eggs reposes. When chill night that care demands, Day and night my toils redouble. Never nearer to the goal, Night and day I feel the trouble Of the wanderer in my soul. End of poem. 
This recording is in the public domain. The Sound of the Trees by Robert Frost Read for LibriVox.org by Winston Tharp I wonder about the trees. Why do we wish to bear forever the noise of these more than another noise so close to our dwelling place? We suffer them by the day until we lose all measure of pace and fixity in our joys and acquire a listening air. They are that that talks of going but never gets away, and that talks no less for knowing as it grows wiser and older that now it means to stay. My feet tug at the floor, and my head sways to my shoulder sometimes when I watch trees sway from the window or the door. I shall set forth for somewhere. I shall make the reckless choice some day when they are in voice and tossing so as to scare the white clouds over them on. I shall have less to say, but I shall be gone. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Spanish Waters by John Macefield Read for LibriVox.org by Liam Neely Spanish waters, Spanish waters, you are ringing in my ears Like a slow, sweet piece of music from the grey forgotten years Telling tales and beating tunes, and bringing weary thoughts to me Of the sandy beach at Muertos where I would that I could be. There's a surf breaks on Los Muertos, and it never stops to roar, and it's there we came to anchor, and it's there we went ashore, where the blue lagoon is silent amid snags of rotting trees, dropping like the clothes of corpses cast up by the seas. We anchored at Los Muertos when the dipping sun was red, we left her half a mile to sea, to west of Niggerhead. And before the mist was on the quay, before the day was done, we were all ashore on Muertos with the golds that we had won. We bore it through the marshes in a half-score battered chests, sinking in the sucking quagmires to the sunburn on our breasts heaving over tree trunks gasping damning at the flies and heat longing for a long drink out of silver in the ship's cool lazarite the moon came white and ghostly as we laid the treasure down there was gear there to make a beggar man as rich as lima town copper charms and silver trinkets from the chests of spanish crews gold to blooms and double moidores louis doors and portagues clumsy yellow metal earrings from the indians of brazil uncut emeralds out of rio bezoar stones from guayaquil silver in the crude and fashioned pots of old arica bronze jewels from the bones of incas desecrated by the dons we smoothed the place with mattocks and we took and blazed the tree which marks yon where the gear is hid that none will ever see and we laid aboard the ship again and south away we steers through the loud surf of los muertos which is beating in my ears I'm the last alive that knows it. All the rest have gone their ways, killed or died or come to anchor in the old mulatta's caves. And I go singing, fiddling, old and starved and in despair. And I know where all that gold is hid, if I were only there. It's not the way to end it all. I'm old and nearly blind. And an old man's past's a strange thing, for it never leaves his mind. And I see in dreams a whiles the beach, the sun's disk dipping red. 
and the tall ship under topsails swaying in past nigger head i'd be glad to step ashore there glad to take a pick and go to the lone blazed cocoa palm tree and the place no others know and lift the gold and silver that has moulded there for years by the loud surf of los muertos which is beating in my ears end of poem this recording is in the public domain this heart that flutters near my heart by james joyce read for LibriVox.org by Martin Giessen in Hazelmere, Surrey. This heart that flutters near my heart, my hope and all my riches is, unhappy when we draw apart, and happy between kiss and kiss, my hope and all my riches, yes, and all my happiness for there as in some mossy nest the wrens will divers treasures keep i laid those treasures i possessed ere that mine eyes had learned to weep shall we not be as wise as they though love live but a day end of poem this recording is in the public domain. To Them Who Trust in Fortune by Thomas Moore Read for LibriVox.org by Algy Pug Perth, Western Australia Thou that art proud of honour, shape, or kin, That heapest up this wretched world its treasure, Thy fingers shine with gold, thy tawny skin with fresh apparel, garnished out of measure, and weenest to have fortune at thy pleasure. Cast up thine eye, and look how slippery chance eludeth her men with change and variance. Sometimes she looketh as lovely, fair, and bright as goodly Venus, mother of Cupid. She becketh, and she smileth on every white. But this cheer feigned may not long abide. There cometh a cloud, and farewell all our pride like any serpent she beginth to swell and looketh as fierce as any fury of hell yet for all that we brittle men are fain so wretched is our nature and so blind as soon as fortune list to laugh again with fair countenance and deceitful mind to crouch and kneel and gape after the wind not one or twain but thousands in a rout like swarming bees come flickering her about then as a bait she bringeth forth her ware silver and gold rich pearl and precious stone on which the amazed people gaze and stare and gape therefore as dogs do for a bone fortune at them laugheth and in her throne amid her treasure and wavering riches Proudly she heaveth as lady and empress. Fast by her side doth weary labour stand, Pale fear also, and sorrow all bewept, Disdain and hatred on that other hand, Eke restless watch, from sleep with travail kept, His eyes drowsy and looking as he slept. Before her standeth danger and envy, Flattery, deceit, mischief, and tyranny, about her cometh all the world to beg. He asketh land, and he to pass would bring this toy and that, and all not worth an egg. He would in love prosper above all thing. He kneeleth down, and would be made a king. He forceth not so he may money have, though all the world account him for a knave. Lo, see ye thus, divers heads, divers wits, Fortune alone as divers as they all, unstable, here and there among them flits, and at a venture down her gifts they fall. Catch whoso may, she throweth great and small, not to all men as cometh son or dew, but for the most part all among a few. And yet her brittle gifts long may not last, 
he that she gave them looketh proud and high she whirleth about and pluckth away as fast and giveth them to another by and by and thus from man to man continually she used to give and take and slyly toss one man to winning of another's loss and when she robbeth one down goes his pride he weepeth and waileth and curseth her full sore but he who receiveth it on t'other side is glad and blesseth her oftentimes therefore but in a while when she loveth him no more she glideth from him and her gifts they too and he her curseth as other fools do alas the foolish people cannot cease nor void her train till they the harm do feel about her alway busily they press but lord how he doth think himself full well that may set once his hand upon her wheel he holdeth fast but upward as he steereth she whippeth her wheel about and there he lieth thus fell julius from his mighty power thus fell darius the worthy king of persia thus fell alexander the great conqueror thus many more that i may well rehearse thus double fortune when she list reverse her slippery favour from them that in her trust she flieth her way and lieth them in the dust she suddenly enhanceth them aloft and suddenly mischieveth all the flock the head that late lay easily and full soft instead of pillows lieth after on the block and yet alas the most cruel proud mock the dainty mouth that ladies kissed have she bringeth in the case to kiss a knave in changing of her course the change showeth this up starts a knave and down there falleth a knight the beggar rich and the rich man poor is hatred is turned to love love to despite this is her sport thus proveth she her might great boast she makes if one be by her power wealthy and wretched both within an hour poverty that of her gifts will nothing take with merry cheer looketh upon the press and seeth how fortune's household goeth to wreck fast by her standeth the wise socrates aristippus pythagoras and many a leash of old philosophers and eke against the sun baketh him poor diogenes in his tun with her is bias whose country lacked defence and whilom of their foes stood so in doubt that each man hastily gan to carry thence and asked him why he nought carried out i bear quoth he all mine with me about wisdom he meant not fortune's brittle fees for nought he counted his which he might lease heraclitus eke list fellowship to keep with glad poverty democritus also of which the first can never cease but weep to see how thick the blinded people go with labour great to purchase care and woe the other laughed to see the foolish apes how earnestly they walk about their japes of this poor sect it is common usage only to take that nature may sustain banishing clean all other surplusage they be content and of nothing complain no niggard eke is of his good so fain but they more pleasure have a thousandfold the secret draughts of nature to behold set fortune's servants by them an ye wall that one is free that other ever thrall that one content that other never full that one in surety t'other like to fall who list to advise them both perceive he shall as great difference between them as we betwixt wretchedness and felicity now have i showed ye both choose what ye list stately fortune or humble poverty that is to say now lieth it in your fist to take here bondage or free liberty but in this point an ye do after me draw ye to fortune labour her to please if that ye think yourself too well at ease and first upon thee lovely shall she smile and friendly on thee cast her wandering eyes embrace thee in her arms and for a while put thee and keep thee in fool's paradise and forth with all whatso thou list devise she will grant thee it liberally perhaps but for all that beware of afterclaps reckon ye may never of her favour sure 
you may in clouds as easily trace an hair or in dry land cause fishes to endure and make the burning fire his heat to spare and all this world in compass to forfare as her to make by craft or engine stable that of her nature is ever variable serve her day and night as reverently upon thy knees as any servant may and in conclusion that thou shalt win thereby shall not be worth thy service i dare say and look yet what she giveth thee to-day with labour won she shall haply to-morrow pluck it again out of thine hand with sorrow wherefore if thou in surety list to stand take poverty's part and let proud fortune go receive no thing that cometh from her hand love manner and virtue they be only though which double fortune may not from thee fro then mayst thou boldly defy her turning chance she can thee neither hinder nor advance but an thou wilt needs meddle with her treasure trust not therein and spend it liberally bear thee not proud nor take not out of measure build not thine house on high up in the sky none falleth far but he who climbeth high remember nature sent thee hither bear the gifts of fortune count them borrowed ware end of poem this recording is in the public domain the unquiet grave by anonymous read for LibriVox.org by lucy perry the wind doth blow today my love and a few small drops of rain I never had but one true love, in cold grave she was lain. I'll do as much for my true love as any young man may. I'll sit and mourn all at her grave for a twelve-month and a day. The twelve-month and a day being up, the dead began to speak. Oh, who sits weeping on my grave, and will not let me sleep? Tis I, my love, sits on your grave, and will not let you sleep. For I crave one kiss of your clay-cold lips and that is all I seek. You crave one kiss of my clay-cold lips, but my breath smells earthy strong. If you have one kiss of my clay-cold lips, your time will not be long. Tis down in yonder garden green, love, where we used to walk. The finest flower that e'er was seen is withered to a stalk. The stalk is withered dry, my love, so will our hearts decay. So make yourself content, my love, Till God calls you away. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. The Wind Hover to Christ Our Lord by Gerard Manley Hopkins. Read for LibriVox.org by Stephen McDermott. I caught this morning morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dauphin, dapple dawn drawn falcon his riding of the rolling level underneath him steady air, and striding high there how he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing in his ecstasy. Then off, off forth on swing, as a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend, the hurl and gliding rebuffed the big wind, my heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achieve of the mastery of the thing. Brute beauty and valor and act, O oh, air pride plume, here buckle, and the fire that breaks from thee then, a billion times told lovelier, more dangerous, O oh my chevalier. No wonder of it, sheer plod, plow down cillian shine, and blue beak embers, ah, my dear, fall, gall themselves and gash gold vermilion. End of poem. This recording is in the public domain. Winter, My Secret by Christina Rossetti Read for LibriVox.org by Leonard Wilson of Springfield, Ohio I tell my secret? No, indeed, not I. Perhaps some day, who knows? But not today. It froze and blows and snows, and you're too curious. Fie! You want to hear it? Well only my secret's mine and i won't tell or after all perhaps there's none suppose there is no secret after all but only just my fun 
to-day's a nipping day a biting day in which one wants a shawl a veil a cloak and other wraps i cannot ope to every one who taps and let the draughts come whistling through my hall come bounding and surrounding me come buffeting astounding me nipping and clipping through my wraps and all i wear my mask for warmth who ever shows his nose to russian snows to be pecked at by every wind that blows you would not peck i thank you for good will believe but leave that truth untested still spring's an expansive time yet i don't trust march with its peck of dust nor april with its rainbow crowned brief showers nor even may whose flowers one frost may wither through the sunless hours perhaps some languid summer day when drowsy birds sing less and less and golden fruit is ripening to excess if there's not too much sun nor too much cloud and the warm wind is neither still nor loud perhaps my secret i may say or you may guess end of poem this recording is in the public domain